Ladies and gentlemen, His Honor Mahfud. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. The Honorable Director of the Center for Democratic Institutions, Australian National University, Dr. Stephen Sherlock. The distinguished guests and participants of the conference. First of all, or first of all, I would like to say thank you to CBI ANU that invited me as the speaker in this conference. The topic that I should present in this conference is relevant with the problem of with the problem faced by Indonesian people, that is pluralism and tolerance. More specifically, the title of my speech is Pluralism versus Intolerance, the review based on the Indonesian constitution and law. Before presenting my speech, I must acknowledge and apologize to all of you that my English is not as good as Australian. <laughs> Please forgive me if I make some mistakes in pronouncing some words in my speech. Indonesia is a country with every, a very high degree of plurality and diversity. Its population consists of approximately 1,129 ethnic groups with different religions, cultures, languages, customs, and other differences. It has been due to such plurality that Indonesia is often regarded as an ideal laboratory for studies on pluralism. Such plurality has been well preserved for decades. Tolerance and mutual respect have become internalized and are being implemented in people's everyday life. However, Indonesia's social cohesion has been weakening lately due to frequent social conflicts tricked by differences. There has been a certain crisis among the people in the form of a tendency reducing to expect and tolerate differences. This has been considered as a sign that tolerance in Indonesia is moving toward a lower level as compared to the previous period of time. As a country with heterogeneous population and currently in the process of rearranging democracy, pluralism has become crucial for Indonesia. Crisis is certainly a serious obstacle of democratization, especially in view of the fact that in the course of its development, the crisis of the crisis of pluralism in Indonesia at the present time is now no longer related only to ethnicity and ethnic groups as it used to be in the past, but it is also related to issues of religion and belief. Differences in understanding, belief and perspective on issues, particularly those related to religion and faith, can easily lead to intolerant actions. Viewed in the context in Indonesia's current in divorce, to rearrange its, its democracy, the culture of intolerance and denial of differences will only temper the consolidation of democracy. Without the support of pluralism and culture of tolerance, democracy is unlikely to be ever consolidated. After all, one of the core values of democracy is the willingness to accept each other and to accommodate diversity. Pluralism, respect and tolerance of difference. I would like now to start my presentation with the definition of pluralism in the sense that I'm using it. Pluralism is commonly understood as a framework for interaction whereby every person and group demonstrate respect and tolerance for each other. Or in other words, pluralism is an attitude that promotes and respects differences and social diversity rather than treating them as mere discourses without an actual action to materialize them in real life behavior. 
Tolerance and mutual respect are the most important aspect which need to be em emphasized in pluralism. Nurholis Majid, an Indonesian Muslim scholar, defined pluralism is, an, is a beautiful sentence, namely, a given engagement of diversities within the bounds of civility. In line with that definition, in line with that definition, Abdurrahman Wahid described pluralism in a more simple way. As a viewing this country, as a viewing this country as a house with many rooms which are occupied by different entities having differences not only in their religion in their religion but also in any other aspects. For the sake of uniting in that house, each person occupying the rooms must respect and appreciate each other without anyone considering himself or herself as the rightful and true owner of the house. This analogy may appear to be simple. Yet it is of extraordinary significance in understanding pluralism. Under such notion, pluralism offers a comfortable space for differences because differences constitute a fundamental entity of an individual of an individual's humanity. Therefore, if rejection of pluralism is still to be found, it's merely caught by misunderstanding which can still be straightened out. One of the examples that comes to mind is the debate regarding the concept of religious pluralism. The purpose of pluralism is not to relativize or to mix up religions. Religious pluralism has never intended to say that all religions are the same. Respecting the followers of the teaching of other religions has no relation to the same and understanding that all religions are the same. Differences in religious teachings clearly indicate the differences between one religion and another. If really every religion has its own context of particularity, hence it is impossible for all religion to be the same and completely identical. One of the intentions of pluralism in religious life is an active, is an active acknowledgement and respect for other religions. A person must respect the existence of the other religions as he respects the extension of his own religion. In order to ensure the pluralism self as an agent of national prosperity, there are at least three universal values that need to be fulfilled, namely freedom, justice, and deliberation. Freedom is a prerequisite for pluralism, in addition to their right to live being protected. The various entities should also be given the opportunity to express their identity in the public space. In this case, the citizen's human right must be granted without exception. There should be no discrimination against anyone in expressing their optional and aspirations to show their existence in so far as it is done in a responsible manner. For the sake of creating justice, the dichotomy between minority and majority must be eliminated. Such dichotomy does not only pose a threat on justice, it can also, it can also lead to a disintegration. Pluralism does not only require willingness to acknowledge the right of existence of other religious groups, but also the willingness to be fair to other groups based on peace and mutual respect. The liberation requires awareness and participation. This means living in harmony, not only socially and practically, but also theologically. Tolerance must be existed. It should not be limited to merely accepting plurality, but it should also include efforts toward ensuring that such plurality brings benefit. 
All these prior pluralism has been understood merely as a form of recognition of the existing differences. However, it has not taken the form of a statement of stance with regard, with regard to such differences. Whereas, in fact, any statement of differences with such stance is extremely dangerous, dangerous as it can potentially lead to conflict. Viewed from the perspective of Indonesia's history, pluralism is the main platform on which of the state of Indonesia was established. Furthermore, pluralism was firmly adopted by the drafters of the constitution during the formulation of the 1945 constitution in 1945. Therefore, it can be safely said that the 1945 Constitution is a pillar of convergence of the existing differences. Based on the result of research of various literatures, I can state that the founding fathers of the Indonesian state had initially varying ideas on the national characteristic to be materialized in accordance with their respective background. However, they finally reach a consensus due to their willingness to respect each other and appreciate other groups. Among members of the Committee 9 of the BPU, BPUPKI, BPUPKS Committee for Preparatory Work for Indonesian Independence, which was assigned to prepare the draft preamble of the 1945 Constitution, differences were finally resolved based on shared consensus whereby all parties were. It was then set forth in the third paragraph of the preamble of the 1945 Constitution which reads as follows, by the grace of God, the Almighty, and motivated by the noble desire to live a free nation life, the people of Indonesia hereby declare their independence. The main idea of this paragraph reflects the convergence of ideas from two political views prevailing in Indonesia at that time, namely secular nationalists and Islamic nationalists. Secular nationalists were striving to set the foundation for a more free national life, separating the state and religion, while Islamic nationalists wanted to have Islamic teachings as the foundation of their struggle. Such convergence led to, the, led to the agreement that Indonesia is not a secular state and it is not a religion-based state either. Or, in scientific term, Indonesia is referred to as a religious nation state. This has been the best middle way solution and accordingly the 1945 constitution does not prescribe a religion based state because it would only lead to tyranny due to the domination of a certain religion which denies plurality. According to the national philosophy, according to the national philosophy, Pancasila, as set forth in the preamble of 1945 constitution, pluralism is one of the main foundation. The first thing believe in the one and only God affirms, affirms the character, characteristic of Indonesia as a religious nation state. The second thing, just and civilized humanity can be construed to mean that every Indonesian citizen shall obtain fair and civilized treatment. At the same time, in, in a broader sense, this nation highly upholds the values of humanity so that every person has equal rights and obligation without any discrimination. The third then, the unity of Indonesia illustrates that this nation is a single unity based on the awareness of and respect for differences and the diversity of backgrounds. This is, has been due to the fact that from the beginning, three there has been an understanding that it was such diversity that fully supported the establishment of the state. 
The fortunate democracy guided by the inner wisdom of deliberations amounts representatively described the unique character and value in this nation, namely togetherness and prioritizing deliberation in making any decision for mutual interest. And the fifth test, social justice for all the people of Indonesia, includes three forms of justice, namely distributive, legal, and commutative justice. In the 1945 Constitution, the principle of pluralism has a special place, and it is specifically confirmed through phrase, through phrase in the provision of the 1945 Constitution, such as the state shall acknowledge, mengakui, maintain, memelihara, respect, menghormati, garanti, menjamin, and provide protection atau perlindungan for the diversity of the Indonesian nation. This can be found in Article 18, Article 20, and Article 29 of the 1945 Constitution. Article 18, for example, provides for the acknowledgement, respect, as well as attention to the existence of special character and plurality of regions in Indonesia, guarantee for the fair arrangement of financial relations, the utilization of natural resources and other economic resources between the central government and regional government is, provide, is provided for in Article 18A, paragraph 2. At the same time, the recognition of specific or special regional governmental units is provided for under Article 18B, paragraph 1. In addition to the above, the recognition of customary law communities as well as their living customary rights are clearly set forth in Article 18B, paragraph 2, including the granting of the broadest possible autonomy to regions. The phrase every person, the phrase every person, as used in the article regarding human rights in the 1945 con Constitution, indicates that the 1945 Constitution provides guarantee and protection for every citizen, regardless of his or her differences and background. Article 20 E. Paragraph 1, for example, states that every person shall be free to embrace his or her religion and to practice worship according to his or her religion. This provision indicates that the state grants such freedom to every person without any exception. Similarly, similarly it stated in Article 29, Paragraph 2 of the 1945 Constitution that the state shall guarantee the freedom of every citizen to embrace his or her religion and to practice worship according to his or her religion and belief. Viewed from this perspective, freedom of religion is quite clear and obvious. The state's guarantee by the state of the freedom to embrace a religion and worship according his or her religion and belief is proof that the 1945 Constitution accepts, recognizes, and at the same time adapts pluralism. Based on the aforementioned provision of the 1945 Constitution, all Indonesian citizens of any cultural identity, ethnicity, gender and religion must be guaranteed and protected by the state. This also means that the state might not discriminate against its citizens under any pretext or for any reason whatsoever. Therefore, if there is still any person who, with his or her ideas and attitude, does not acknowledge or deny pluralism, either tacitly or openly, it implies at least two negative matters. The first one is from the perspective of the national principle. Denial of pluralism is the rejection of the principle of Benika Tunggal Ika. Benika Tunggal Ika means united in diversity. 
It means, it means that those who read the pluralism do not fully understand that Pancasila and the 1945 Constitution are consensus arising from the tolerance of the founding fathers. And the second, from the perspective of democracy and constitution, those who reject pluralism do not understand the very essence of the existence of the state and all the current condition of democracy. Democracy upholds pluralism whereby the rights and freedoms of citizens are protected by, by the 1945 constitution and the third denial the third, denial of pluralism reflects a weak national vision which can drive the nation into failure in achieving the ideals of democracy as intended in the 1945 constitution. Tolerance in the freedom of religion. As I mentioned earlier, the current crisis of pluralism in Indonesia has been more often related to issues of religion. That is why I would also like to put some emphasis on the principle of freedom of religion in Indonesia. Because it is based on this principle of freedom of religion that tolerance should rise and then be developed for further application in practice. Tolerance aims at establishing peaceful life among various community, among various community groups from different religion, culture, and identity background. Tolerance is not something that should be forced. It's something that springs from awareness and sincerity. Tolerance has the potential to bring about the accept acceptance of difference recognition and respect, respect for the existence and right of other people. Enthusiastically supporting the diversity of God's creation. In this part, I would like to elaborate on the fact that the drafters of the 1945 constitution demonstrated that with tolerance, they have left behind selfishness and were willing to compromise to eventually reach and accept mutual consensus. After having conducted a historical tracing of the 1945 Constitution, especially in relation to the principle of freedom of religion, I have reached several conclusions like that. First, in discussing articles related to freedom of religion, there was no significant debate in terms of substance in the 1945 Constitution. Basically, the drafters of the Constitution agreed to the idea to accommodate the principle of freedom of religion for every citizen. Every though Muslims are the majority, even though Muslims are majority in Indonesia, I repeat, basically, the drafters of the Constitution agreed to the idea to accommodate the principle of freedom of religion for every citizen, even though Muslims are the majority in Indonesia. There was a, there was a commonly shared vision that freedom of religion had to be accommodated, had to be accommodated in the Constitution which was being drafted. Bearing in mind the diverse anthropological and sociological backgrounds of the nation. Second, even though Islam is the religion of the majority in Indonesia, at the same, at the same the constitution was drafted, Islamic groups did not wish to play a law that was exclusively applicable to the Muslim only. On the contrary, they had the awareness of not limiting the people's freedom to embrace religions other than Islam. They agreed to the need of ensuring the freedom to every citizen to follow and practice any religion and to worship according to their respective religion and faith. The third, if we observe Article 929, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution, in particular the phrase the freedom of worship each according to his or her own religion or belief. 
It's actually an affirmation that the concept of freedom of religion and faith meant that the citizens are ensured freedom to embrace a religion, but it gives no opportunity for atheism or anti-religion propaganda. Anti-religion propaganda in Indonesia. But on the conclusion of the above historical tracing, it is quite obvious that the drafters of the Constitution decided the 1945 Constitution which recognizes and guarantees the freedom of religion and faith. In an explicit manner, Article 28E and Article 29, Paragraph 2 of the 1945 Constitution expressly state that the state guarantee the freedom of religion and faith. Article 28E, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 2 of the 1945 Constitution states as follows. Every person shall be free to choose and to practice the religion of his or her choice, to choose one's education, to choose one's employment, to choose one's citizenship, and to choose one's place of residence within the state territory, to live it, and to subsequently return to it. Every person shall have the right to the freedom to believe his or her faith and to express his or her views and thought in accordance with his or her conscience. The four main such provisions state two freedoms, namely the freedom to choose religion, namely the freedom to choose religion and the freedom to practice the religion of a person's choice. Moreover, Article 28 I of the 1945 Constitution affirms that the freedom of religion cannot be diminished, diminished under any circumstances whatsoever. This implies an actual affirmation that under any circumstances, the state might not limit the right of freedom of religion as an intrinsic right of every citizen. In this context, embracing a religion and the freedom to practice the religion of a person's choice is every man's right. The right of freedom of the right of freedom of religion and faith is a human right which might not be reduced under any circumstances whatsoever. However, we certainly cannot implement the above pension provision in the same way as Western countries, which tend to be secular. The implementation of human rights in Indonesia must be in line with the philosophy, culture, and social structure of Indonesia, which is principally religious. In the philosophical context, the fulfillment of human rights must always be based on the principle of balance with fundamental obligations. Human rights will be fulfilled when people also fulfill their fundamental obligations. Ada kewajiban. In other words, the upholding of human rights is determined by the upholding of the principle of balance between human rights and fundamental obligation, and at the same time it serves as an indicator of the people's moral degree and dignity. Furthermore, Article 29 of the 1945 Constitution states as follows. The state shall be based upon the belief in the one and only God. The state shall guarantee all persons the freedom of worship according to his or her own religion or belief. The forming an article affirm that duty and responsibility of the state to protect the freedom of religion and the freedom of worship for Indonesian citizens. In the context of the state of Indonesia that recognized the significant position of religion, in my view, the protection of the freedom of religion must be combined with the protection of the purity of religious teaching. This means that while there is a need to guarantee the freedom of religion, 
of freedom of religion which deviates from the right path cannot be allowed. Therefore, the state's responsibility toward religion, state's responsibility toward religion is not merely providing protection to citizens to freely embrace religion, but also providing service to the followers of religion and at the same time and, and, and at the same and at the same time protecting the purity of religious teachings against all kinds of deviation. In general, Article 29 of the 1945 Constitution needs to be understood to mean that the state guarantees and manages relations among religious followers so as not to disrupt life as a state. While the state recognizes and protects religious diversity in Indonesia, it is also entitled to require religious followers to unite in building the state and the nation. Therefore, freedom of religion under the 1945 Constitution does not only lie on whether or not a religion is right or wrong, but it also concerns the manner in which the willingness to appreciate and accept the existence of other people with different religions and faith and with different religion and faith is developed. According to religious ritual practices by religious institutions together with their followers are not only an assertion of the belief in God, but they should also consolidate unity and brotherhood of the state and should not trigger any conflicts, resolving the problem of tolerance. By reading the provision of the 1945 Constitution, it becomes evident that the principle of religious freedom is absolutely clear at the constitutional level. Clear at the constitutional level. Therefore, although religious freedom related problems are still frequently occurring, the issue is not at the conceptual level of the 1945 Constitution. So, the issue is not at the conceptual level of the 1945 Constitution, but rather at the implementation level. In the reform era, religious freedom related problems still frequently occur. Particularly, particularly in the form of discrimination against minority religions. Discrimination is actualized in various forms of acts, ranging from sermons of writing using a tone which verifies certain groups, the closing of places of forces, attacks against a dern of certain religion, physical and psychological intimidation, as well as compulsion to follow the main religious orientation up to the issuance of the religious edicts which are considered intolerant. Incidents such, incident such as attacks on the Indonesian Ahmadiyya congregation, Yama Ahmadiyya in several regions, the Parliament of Yasmin Indonesian Christian Church in Bogor, the class in Sampang which indicate the nuance of conflict between the Shia and Sunni religious orientation, are some concrete examples of the implementation of religious freedom principle. In, the desert, in addition to that, the circular letter, Surat Edar, the circular letter which only recognizes six official religions is another example of discrimination. Push on to the uh, push on to the aforementioned letter. Push on to the aforementioned circular letter. Persons or communities outside the official religions are categorized as having no religion. While not having the level of an officially recognized religion makes it difficult for such person or communities to receive or obtain services from the state and obtain civil rights and station as citizens. Similarly, the acts of violence committed in the name of religion by certain religious community organizations also constitute an issue in the application for, of the principle of the religious freedom. 
Community organizations which commit acts of violence usually tend to put a stronger emphasis on the aspect of religious formality and negation, resulting in the attitude of exclusivity. In addition to that, such community organizations cannot avoid the reality of the threat of the all political paradigm. As a result of such paradigm, community organizations compete with each other in their in the world to demonstrate their existence. Consequently, they often come face to face with the force of other community organizations or community ailments causing friction followed by intolerant act and behavior. Such reality strongly indicate the incompatibility of the guarantee of religious freedom under the 1945 Constitution in the implementation of state law. Instead of bringing tolerance, religious freedom creates intolerance. This fact indicates that the guarantee of religious freedom under the 1945 Constitution is yet to be truly materialized. If we observe first, we can see that one of the fundamental issues is the anarchism of laws and regulation under the 1945 Constitution. Numerous, numerous laws and regulations are not synchronized, thus resulting in discordant parties. Harmonization and synchronization of legal rules related to religious freedom have been conducted. However, it has not been optimal. The fact, the fact is that the issues of religious freedom and interfaith relations highly depend on such harmonization. One of the laws and regulations which are still in fact is law number one, 1965, concerning the prevention of the misuse and discretion of religion. The substance of this law basically prohibits people from making religious interpretation and conducting religious activities which deviate from the principles of religious teaching. Such provision actually represent the state's intention to protect Indonesian citizens by protecting religious teaching against misuse and, des and desecration. At the same time, the state also has the intention to prohibit other religious orientation from making interpretations outside the conventional teachings. However, the aforementioned law has resulted in polemic due to different interpretations. Some people have requested that the law be reformed. Others have requested that it be maintained, and some others have requested that it be revised. This image when the law was petitioned for judicial review at the Constitutional Court in 2010. The, pe the petition consisted of several NGOs and individuals requested that the law be revoked on the ground that the law was inconstitutional since it was contradictory to the spirit of religious freedom as provided for under the 1945 Constitution. Moreover, the law was also considered as a form of the state's unnecessary intervention in religious freedom. At the same time, some other parties stated that the law had to be maintained, have to be maintained in order to preserve harmony among religious people. In decision number 140, pronounced on April 19, 2010, the Constitutional Court rejected the petition of the petitioner. The consideration given by the Constitutional Court was that the state served the role of ensuring that in the implementation of religious freedom, a person does not harm the religious freedom of others. The Constitutional Court stated that the law does not limit religious freedom. Instead, this law prohibits 
a person from expressing feeling which are hostile in nature to other religions or constitute the desecration of religions of principle of the teaching of religions existing in Indonesia. In this regard, although the interpretation of the belief in religious teaching is part of the freedom existing within forum internal, such interpretation must be in accordance with the principles of religious teaching applying the proper methodology based on the sources of the relevant religious teaching, namely the only book of the each religion, therefore the freedom to make interpretations to make interpretations of religion is not absolute in nature. An interpretation which is not based on the methodology generally acknowledged by the adherents of the religion concerned and is not based on the relevant holy book source is likely to cause reaction which threaten public security and, and order if such interpretation is stated or practiced in public. Numerous ideas have emerged stating that religious or religious desecration should not be regulated by the state or in other words the state should not interfere with matter of belief of its citizens. The argument supporting those ideas is that the state must be neutral toward all religions and it must not prohibit the, self, the creation of any local belief or religion. As a consequence, if there is a group intending to establish its own religion, the state cannot prohibit it. According to the proponents of this idea, Law No. 1, 1965, is no longer needed since the freedom of expression and the freedom to hold a belief constitute the right which are inherent, cannot be limited, cannot be postponed, and cannot be forfeited. However, in my opinion, I wonder if the lack of regulation by the state will further guarantee religious freedom. Will it Will it not be the contrary in which the implication will be worse? This is because, in my opinion, without regulation by the state, acts of violence committed in the name of religion will increase instead. The reason for this is that a person's sensitivity to what a person's religion tends to be very high. Particularly when a person's religion is being criticized or even desecrated. The lack of regulation by the state will in fact open up the opportunity for flexible interpretation of matter considered to be the des desecration of religion. It would make it easy for people to create rules solely based on subjectivity and according to their respective religion with different standards or belief. The phenomenon of punishing those considered to be non-compliant with the mainstream will occur easily based on arguments and methods instructed in their religion. And the last legal rules of the state are still limited. In order to uphold the religious freedom under the 1945 Constitution, the state must continue to participate in regulating religious life through legal rules. The instrument of such legal rules are needed for, as I have stated earlier, accepting that the state's responsibility are not merely to provide recognition and protection of religious freedom, but also to protect the purity of religious teachings against becoming corrupted or against deviation as well as to strengthen unity and fraternity. Therefore, in making legal rules concerning religious freedom, the state must, consist, must consistently refer to Pancasila as the fundamentals of the state of Indonesia which has established four legal guiding norms. The norm constitutes the norms constitute a consequence of the status of Pancasila as a legal idea, either, 
which serve as the fundamental and objective of every law in Indonesia. The guiding norms are among other things. But Indonesian laws must have the objective of and guarantee the integration of the nation, both territorially as well as ideologically. Laws in Indonesia may not have any substance which can potentially cause territorial and ideological disintegration. The second, laws, ma laws must simultaneously, simultaneously develop democracy and democracy. Democracy and democracy. Laws in Indonesia cannot be made solely based on the highest number of supporters, but rather they must also be derived from the philosophy of Pancasila and proper procedures. Third, develop social justice. The creation of laws which encourage or allow socio-economic gap due to the exploitation of the weak by the strong without the state's protection cannot be justified. And the fourth, developing, developing civilized religious tolerance. The laws, the laws must not give preference to or discriminate certain groups based on the number of adherents of religion. State laws may not require the application of religious laws, however, the state must facilitate, the state must facilitate, protect, and guarantee the safety of its nation in practicing their religious teaching based on their own beliefs and consciousness. Legal rules, legal rules which are meant to regulate religious freedom must at least have the objective and objective of and guarantee the integration of the nation as well as developing civilized religious tolerance. We need to be aware that religion, in a sense of ability, lies within the private domain. Thus, the state does not have the authority to regulate, to regulate it. Therefore, regulation is limited to the manner in which each person expresses a person's belief as a way of ensuring that it does not impair or violate other people's rights. The legal rules should only be regulating social life, the interaction and interrelation among citizens adhering to different religions in the community, national and state life. This means that religious legal rules are not met in the context of regulating religious activities and religious life as individuals and, and in the internal community of adherents of religions, nor to regulate religious activities related to the experience, sacredness, and ritual according to the belief of each respective religion. The state must not make legal rules which obligate something which has been obligated in the religious teachings, or vice versa, which prohibit something which have clearly been prohibited by the religion consent. In order to further guarantee the formation of legal rules concerning religious freedom in accordance with such law, principally, the state can make regulation or even restriction with regard to the freedom to act. However, not in issues concerning the right to religious freedom and to hold a belief in the sense of the freedom to be. The regulation by the state in terms of religious life is meant in the context of providing protection of the citizen. Protection of the citizen not as a form intervention to the freedom of expression and the freedom to hold a belief. As an example, in resolving the issue of Jamaah Ahmadiyah on June 9 of June 2009, the state issued a joint decree of the Minister of Religious Affairs, the Attorney General and the Minister of Home Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia concerning the warning and order to the adherents, members, and or member of the executive body of Jamaat Ahmadiyah and the citizen. 
the issuance of the joint decree was not intended to discriminate against Jamaah Ahmadiyah, but rather it was intended to maintain harmony among citizens, to prevent deviant interpretation of religious teaching as well as to protect the Ahmadiyya congregation. The Jai Decree basically orders the adherents of Ahmadiyya to stop all of their activities which are contradictory of Islamic teaching, although it does not prohibit the existence of the adherents of Ahmadiyya in Indonesia. Based on the four mentioned examples, legal rules are important as instruments for asserting that religious freedom has its limits, which must be considered, including public safety, public order, her morality and descent and decency, and what is equally important, religious freedom must not interfere with and impair other people's rights. With such understanding, religious freedom will not be implemented out of control and haphazardly, but rather it will be harmonized with the principles of the 1945 Constitution. It must be avoided an incorrect understanding of the religious freedom principle results in acts of intolerance contradictory to the 1945 Constitution and hinders democratization in Indonesia. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bapak Ketua Mahkamah Konstitusi, Bapak Mahkud MD, Bapak Tuhan Besar Republik Indonesia, Pak Naji Besar Kusuma, dan Bapak Ibu Ibu yang saya hormati. Thank you very much for your address. We now have some time for questions, and I will throw the floor open. Uh, we have two interpreters, Sue Piper and Philip Gould, who will be able to interpret questions or answers in the Indonesian guidelines. Uh, can I just ask, make three points before we start? Can I please ask that you give your name and any affiliation of the courtesy and ask your question? And secondly, remember, a short question is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take some questions. Yes, please. Memang betul beberapa waktu yang lalu Komnas Perempuan datang kepada saya 
bukan untuk mengajukan perkara tetapi untuk menyampaikan data-data hasil penelitian tentang apa yang mereka sebut sebagai diskriminasi terhadap kaum perempuan. Yeah, it's true that a while back the uh, National Commission of Women's Rights came to me not in order to put forward a legal case but to give me some data resulting from some research regarding discrimination against women. Mereka juga menunjukkan kepada saya beberapa peraturan yang jumlahnya lebih dari 150 yang menurut Komisi Nasional Perempuan bertentangan dengan asas non-diskriminasi yang ada di dalam Undang-Undang Dasar Indonesia. They also showed me so more than 150 rules which according to the Commission of Women's Rights were in contradiction to the rights of non-discrimination which is laid down in the Indonesian Constitution. Saya mengatakan bahwa pada saat ini setelah era reformasi Indonesia itu terbuka untuk melakukan perbaikan-perbaikan peraturan yang dianggap diskriminatif terhadap satu kelompok masyarakat. I said that now in the era of reformation Indonesia is open or has the possibility to make improvements in rules which consider to be discriminatory. Oleh sebab itu ada dua jalan yang saya tawarkan kepada Komnas Perempuan pada saat itu. Yang pertama mengajukan gugatan judicial review ke Mahkamah Agung, bukan ke Mahkamah Konstitusi. The first one would be to put an application for a judicial review not to the Constitutional Court but to the Supreme Court. Karena peraturan-peraturan yang ditunjukkan kepada saya itu bentuknya adalah peraturan pemerintah dan peraturan daerah, bukan undang-undang. Because the regulations which they had put to me were not legislative ones, but they were regulations from governments and from the regions. Dan yang kedua, saya menawarkan melalui gerakan politik, yaitu meminta legislatif review ke DPR maupun DPRR. Also, what I secondly said, I offered that they, or I put forward the suggestion that they take up the role, the the path of political movement for legislative review through the national parliament or the regional parliaments. Jadi sekarang sudah terbuka jalan hukum dan konstitusi untuk memperbaiki peraturan-peraturan yang dianggap diskriminatif itu. So there is this option to take the legal or constitutional route to try to correct those kinds of. Difficulties with regulations. Yeah, that's my answer. Siti Jones from the International Crisis Group. You said that it is the role of the state to protect the purity of religious teachings, and yet. Don't you think that there is a difference of opinion frequently on what is pure? Take, for example, the, the role of Shiism in Indonesia, where you have Surya Dharma Ali saying it's sesat, and you have other people saying it's not. So, so I think my own opinion is that it's dangerous for the state to try to do that when you have many different interpretations of purity. So I would like your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah. Just one word. It's yeah, yeah. like deviant. Yeah. Yeah. Baik, uh, Ibu Sydney Jones, uh, Anda menanyakan tentang penafsiran inti atau penafsiran yang uh, asli murni dari sebuah agama itu siapa yang menafsirkan? itu memang sesuatu yang sulit bagi kami di Indonesia karena semua aliran itu mengaku penafsirannya lah yang paling asli penafsirannya lah yang paling asli sehingga terjadi problem bagi uh, pelaksanaan uh, Ajaran-ajaran agama bagi berbagai aliran di Indonesia. That's good, Sydney Jones. Bringing up the question of the essence of interpretation and purity. So, who is to interpret what is correct? Well, really, that is a difficult thing for us in Indonesia because we have all these different streams of thought, and they all recognise the original source. So, it becomes a problem then in the implementation. 
So all of the religious teachings go back from these various um, religious streams of thought go back to that original source. Oleh sebab itu ada dua hal pokok dari putusan Mahkamah Konstitusi yang diputuskan uh, pada uh, dua tahun yang lalu itu. And for that reason, two years ago, there were two main points decided on by the Constitutional Court. Pertama, tidak boleh ada konflik horizontal antar masyarakat karena perbedaan penafsiran. Firstly, there cannot be horizontal conflict among society because of differences of interpretation. Harus ada kekuatan negara yang menjamin ketertiban sosial sehingga tidak terjadi anarki di tengah-tengah masyarakat dan masyarakat tidak membuat hukum sendiri. There has to be the power of the state to guarantee security within society. There cannot be anarchy at that level. And that um, society or the community cannot take the law into its own hands. Dan tentang penafsiran yang asli bagi ajaran agama, sementara ini Mahkamah Konstitusi menyatakan diserahkan kepada majelis permusawaratan agama-agama masing-masing. Seperti Majelis Ulama Indonesia untuk Islam bersama ormas-ormasnya, kemudian Dewan Gereja Indonesia, Majelis Wali Gereja Indonesia dan sebagainya. Regarding the original correct uh, interpretation of religions, the Constitutional Court said that that's really up to the consultative um, councils and agencies of the various religions. For example, the MUI in the case of Islam. Um, social organizations, uh, church councils, and so on. Uh, itu menurut kami merupakan pilihan terbaik di antara berbagai pilihan yang semuanya sulit untuk dipilih demi membangun ketertiban dan penegakan hukum di Indonesia. And in our opinion, that's the best choice among difficult choices. That is to maintain order and to uphold the rule of law. Meskipun begitu, kami juga memberi catatan di dalam putusan Mahkamah Konstitusi itu bahwa undang-undang itu bisa diperbaiki dan disempurnakan agar lebih akomodatif terhadap berbagai kepentingan kelompok agama. And for that reason, um, in our decision of the Constitutional Court, we said that improvements can be made in the laws for, and they can be purified or refine to be more accommodative towards various religious interests. Sayangnya, Mahkamah Konstitusi itu tidak bisa mengatur sesuatu, melainkan hanya boleh membatalkan atau membenarkan bahwa itu boleh dilanjutkan dan diperbaiki. The pity is that the Constitutional Court cannot regulate these matters. It only has the power to withdraw the laws or cancel the laws or to say that they can be continued. Thank you. We've got quite a few people queuing, but I'll take a question up there. Please, yes, you. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Ray. I'm a student at the ADU. I have a question. I, I would like to get you to perhaps comment on the case of Ayurveda uh, Ahan, a young civil servant, or former civil servant, I should say, yeah. who's currently serving a two and a half year sentence for posting on a Facebook page dedicated for atheist community about the, well, questioning the existence of our God and, and, and sharing images that are considered as insulting to Islam. And I'm, I'm just wondering, in your opinion, uh, do you see a problem with the Indonesian government's position regarding the impossibility of uh, an Indonesian citizen to uh, register him or herself as non-affiliated to any particular religion and that it is well, given in, in the light of uh, the sentence of Alexander Ahan, uh, would you say that it's virtually impossible to have any academic discussions about the existence of God and the positions of atheism whatsoever? Thank you. Saya belum mengerti kasus soal Ahan itu apa yang Baik, itu eh, tadi saya singgung sedikit di dalam makalah saya. Saya begini, di Indonesia itu negara 
berdasar ketuhanan yang Esa yang berarti negara itu dan bangsanya percaya kepada Tuhan yang kemudian dilembagakan dalam bentuk agama-agama. I touched on that briefly in my speech earlier. Indonesia is a country which is based on ketuhanan yang Esa, the Almighty God, or belief in the Almighty God. In other words, a belief in God, and that takes its institutional um, form in various religions. Ketika uh, Kanselir Jerman Barat uh, Merkel bertemu dengan saya, dia menanyakan hal yang sama tentang orang yang tidak beragama di Indonesia, apakah boleh hidup di Indonesia atau tidak? And when I met with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she brought up the same issue. She asked, well, people in Indonesia who are not religious, can they live in Indonesia? <laughs> Saya menjawab waktu itu bahwa orang beragama, orang tidak beragama, orang ateis ataupun orang komunis boleh hidup di Indonesia, tetapi tidak boleh mempropagandakan ajarannya. And my answer to her at that time was, people who are not religious or who are atheists or communists, yes, they can live in Indonesia, but they cannot propagate their beliefs. Sebab kalau hanya orang mengaku komunis atau mengaku ateis. Sejauh tidak mengajak orang lain, itu merupakan hak asasi yang tidak bisa dicampur oleh negara. And as far as people who are communists or atheists, and as far as they don't try to teach other people their beliefs, that is their human right. Di Indonesia ada seorang anggota DPR yang terang-terangan mengaku bahwa saya bangga mengaku sebagai orang komunis. Tetapi Indonesia mengizinkan dia menjadi anggota DPR dan tidak dibawa ke penjara. And there is a, in Indonesia a member of the national parliament who proudly stated that he's a communist. However, Indonesia allowed him to be a member of, or him or her to be a member of parliament, and that person was not imprisoned. Jadi larangan komunisme dan ateisme di Indonesia adalah kalau orang itu mengajak orang lain untuk ikut paham. Itu adalah hukum dan konstitusi di Indonesia. So as to this prohibition on people being communist or atheist in Indonesia, that's only if they try to spread those teachings to other people. That is by the Indonesian law and constitution. Kalau hanya untuk dirinya sendiri, untuk kehidupan di rumah, di kamar atau di mana pun itu tidak dilarang sama sekali. If it's just that belief, those beliefs are just for themselves, just for their life at home or in, in their in their bedroom, well, that's not really an issue. Dan akhirnya tetapi itu masih menjadi pekerjaan rumah bagi bagi Indonesia untuk diatur lebih lanjut agar lebih akomodatif terhadap hak asasi manusia. And so finally, that is some homework for Indonesia to deal with. We have to do some further regulation in order to be more accommodative towards these people's human rights. Thank you. We have a question. Thank you, uh, sir. Um, my question is: uh, Does do you think that the education system in Indonesia? accommodate pluralism and tolerance enough? If yes, what is your opinion about the changing of uh, the curriculum that kind of uh, have less stressing on uh, science and social sciences? Uh, my second question is regarding the drafting of the gender equality law. I'm very supportive toward that law because uh, there are two strong points in the gender equality uh, law under discussion. The first one is that the nation has a responsibility uh, to create an environment that doesn't discriminate uh, women. Uh, and the second one is that the citizen also has a responsibility to teach their children uh, to be uh, gender sensitive or uh, to promote gender equality. Thank you. Okay. Back, uh Ibu Tomo tentang apa tadi kurikulum dalam rangka perlindungan hak asasi manusia. Menurut eh, saya kita terbuka. Saya tak saya tadi mengatakan di dalam paper saya itu bahwa ada dua level kalau kita mau memahami konstitusi di Indonesia. Pertama pada level konstitusi dan aturan hukum itu sudah jelas perlindungan 
terhadap hak asasi manusia itu mencakup semua hal. Lalu pada tingkat implementasi ada pelanggaran-pelanggaran. Dan pada tingkat implementasi juga kami sekarang sedang menyiapkan berbagai perangkat untuk memperbaiki masalah-masalah yang dibutuhkan tadi. Uh, on the issue of the curriculum and the protection of human rights, what I said earlier in my paper is that there are two levels of understanding here. Uh, sorry, we at the court understand with the Indonesian constitution and Indonesian law, it's clear that they do protect human rights. Uh, but then as to the implementation and uh, violations of those rights, we are um, preparing at various levels to try to improve those or make improvements in those areas which you mentioned. Tentu itu terus menjadi perdebatan karena kita memang sangat plural di Indonesia sangat majemuk sehingga berbagai pikiran itu selalu beradu dengan pikiran-pikiran lain yang pada saatnya harus diselesaikan karena itu selalu menjadi uh, perbenturan pendapat di kalangan masyarakat. And this is sure to be uh, issues which which will be debated because in Indonesia we're a very pluralistic place and our thoughts get mixed with other thoughts and always there are differences of opinion which, which arise. Uh, mengenai yang kedua Rancangan Undang-Undang Kesetaraan Gender sekarang ini memang sedang menjadi polemik yang cukup besar di Indonesia. And regarding the second issue of the draft law on gender equality, that is definitely at the moment a very big, or the topic of very big polemic in Indonesia. Salah satu isu penting dari rancangan undang-undang itu apakah orang itu boleh hidup, uh, boleh melakukan perkawinan sesama jenis. Laki-laki dengan laki-laki, perempuan dengan perempuan. One important issue in the draft law is whether people should be allowed to marry those of the same gender, a male with a male, a female with a female. Dan kemudian sekarang ini pendapat yang berbeda berbenturan. Yang satu mengatakan bahwa masalah homoseksual atau masalah lesbianisme itu adalah melekat sebagai hak asasi manusia. And at the moment, one point of difference of opinion is one on the issue of whether homosexuality or lesbianism is a human rights issue. Tetapi kelompok yang lain mengatakan bahwa hak asasi manusia di Indonesia dibatasi oleh undang-undang, di mana pembatasan itu ditentukan karena ajaran agama, karena moral dan karena ketertiban umum. But other groups say that human rights in Indonesia are limited um, by law, limited um, in the sense of because of religious teachings, morality, or public order. Itu diatur di dalam pasal 28 I ayat 2 undang-undang dasar. That is regulated in section 28 I Romans 2 of the Constitution. Nah sekarang perdebatan sedang berlangsung dan kita bisa ikuti uh, bagaimana akhir dari perdebatan ini. And that's been dealt with at the, more, at the moment, so we'll see how that debate ends. Thank you. I think I've discriminated against the less populated part of the city. Did you say? Are there any questions from the city of the, those sitting here? Speak now, forever hold your peace, all right. Um, up there, up the top. Sorry, in the very back row. Return to the densely populated city. It's working. Test. Uh, I'm Henry Sitorus. I'm a PhD student here at the U, but at at Sri. Uh, I think you mentioned about the uh, recognition of minority, but my question is also uh, there are a lot of uh, non-recognition of uh, indigenous people, uh, religion. Uh, I think that is very common that they have to mention the religion as the list, the, the one listed in five religion, whether it's Christian, Muslim, etc. So I think that's one problem. Another thing is that uh, on indigenous people, 
is also a problem of the, their customary law because there are a lot of issues that their right to resources such as land or forest has been marginalized. And the, uh, my next question is that the, the problem of implement, implementation, I think, is the problem of leadership. So I think now there are a lot of uh, claim that Indonesia is having a leadership crisis. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> Baik, saya tidak akan menjawab pertanyaan yang kedua. <laughs> Mau menjawab pertanyaan tentang agama lokal. Um, I, I probably would not, I'd prefer not to comment on the last question, but just on the, the local matters. Begini. <laughs> Uh, jadi di Indonesia itu memang ada agama-agama yang uh, tumbuh dari masyarakat adat sendiri seperti di Jawa Barat itu ada, kemudian di Jawa Timur juga ada. Tetapi sekarang menghadapi problem seperti yang kata yang saudara katakan tadi. Yes, yeah, so, so in Indonesia yes there are um, traditional societies that have their own um, religions as uh, in West Java and East Java that have problems such as the ones you mentioned. Problemnya adalah kalau mereka kawin karena tidak mempunyai agama yang dikenal sebagai agama yang dikenal secara resmi oleh Indonesia lalu mereka itu tidak bisa mendapat akta perkawinan. So one of the problems is when they get married because their religion is not one of the officially recognized religions by the state they are not they are unable to get a copy of the marriage certificate. Dan kalau tidak mendapat akta perkawinan akan menjadi masalah besar bagi keturunannya karena dia juga tidak bisa diberi akta kelahiran. And of course that creates a large problem also for their offspring because they, it means that they are unable to obtain a birth certificate. Dan kalau tidak mempunyai akta kelahiran dia akan sulit masuk sekolah dan memasuki lapangan-lapangan kerja yang disediakan oleh negara. <laughs> It creates difficulties for them to enter school and or to enter avenues of work that are provided by the state. Oleh sebab itu, kira-kira enam bulan yang lalu saya memfasilitasi pertemuan antara tokoh-tokoh masyarakat adat dengan Menteri Koordinator Politik Hukum dan Keamanan. Sorry, my pen's just running. Yeah, Terrible yeah, problem yeah. for an interpreter. Yeah. So around six months ago, I coordinated a meeting to discuss such matters with the relevant authorities. Lalu untuk sementara, sampai nanti ada undang-undang yang lebih menjamin kepastian hukum, disepakati bahwa mereka yang lahir dari perkawinan yang agamanya berdasarkan adat itu supaya diberi akte kelahiran tanpa menyebut tanggal perkawinan dan tanpa menyebut agama. And so um, for the time being until we obtain a, a law which provides some sort of legal certainty to people of these religious backgrounds it has been decided that for such people they will be enabled to they will be able to obtain a birth certificate that does not mention the date of their marriage nor um, give, uh, Notes down their religion. Sekarang yang sejauh saya dengar pemerintah sedang mempersiapkan perangkat administrasi untuk melaksanakan itu sambil menunggu undang-undang tentang kependudukan yang akan diperbaiki. Um, and as far as I know, the, the government is in the process of preparing the administrative apparatus um, before this. Um, Uh, improvement to the uh, law of residency um, is achieved. Yang sudah pasti, Indonesia sekarang ini sangat pro terhadap perlindungan hak asasi manusia dan itu sudah dituangkan di dalam undang-undang kewarganegaraan yang salah satu anggota pansusnya hadir di sini pada hari ini Bapak Selamat Effendi Yusuf. Dulu menjadi pimpinan pansus tentang kewarganegaraan di DPR bersama saya. And it, it must be said that Indonesia it has a, a very strong uh, uh, approach to the protection of uh, human rights and particularly as uh, promulgated in the law of uh, citizenship. And in fact we have one of the special committee members here, uh, Mr. Slamet Defender Yusuf, who was a member of that special committee in Parliament together with myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
thank you. Yes, please. Your microphone is coming. Thank you. My name is I'm from ANU. Um, I'm puzzled with uh, your explanation because in the beginning you listed a number of serious issues like uh, Ahmadiyya, Greza, Yasmin, Kamil, uh, Dunsia, and Shuni, which already uh, caused so many victims. But on the other hand, you mentioned that the legal framework is sufficient to protect uh, the rights of Indonesian citizens and to exercise the freedom of uh, religion. If uh, legal framework is, you think, sufficient, what would be the the, the, the problem of the unresolved uh, religious conflict in Indonesia, which you already mentioned that is continues. And also the, the fact that uh, vigilantes like FBI keep operating without any uh, restraint from the government. So my question to you would be, uh, what would be your suggestions to the current SBY uh, finishing government? to resolve this issue or to the coming uh, government of uh, Indonesia. Thank you. Baik. Uh, perlindungan hukum atas asasi manusia pada level konstitusi dan sistem hukum dan perangkat aturan hukum sudah jelas. Dan uh, dituangkan secara resmi di dalam hukum-hukum negara. Um, so, the protection of human rights is clearly uh, uh, protected under the constitution, under our laws, and the system of regulations, regulations that we have uh, to protect yeah, human rights in Indonesia, according to state law. Terhadap konflik-konflik yang ada sekarang, memang penyelesaiannya tidak cukup hanya dengan hukum semata-mata. Oleh sebab itu, maka pemerintah membentuk tim untuk rekonsiliasi, pertemuan antar tokoh-tokoh masyarakat, pertemuan antar tokoh-tokoh agama, untuk tidak semata-mata menyelesaikan secara hukum karena kalau secara hukum kadang-kala ada kelompok yang merasa uh, tidak dapat keadilan dari hukum. Um, but this conflict in Indonesia cannot just be purely settled through law. And um, this is why the government has set up a reconciliation team and also meetings between social leaders and religious leaders. Be, um, not just a legal settlement, because uh, sometimes these groups also feel that it's difficult for them to get a settlement, the sort of resolution they require through the law. Ketidakpuasan terhadap aturan hukum itu tidak bisa dihindari. Pasti terjadi di dalam masyarakat mana saja yang memang uh, aspirasinya berbeda-beda, keyakinannya berbeda-beda. Nah, oleh sebab itu maka penyelesaian jangan hanya jalur hukum semata-mata, tetapi melalui pendekatan politik, sosial, dan sebagainya. And this is not surprising that um, the settlement or satisfaction cannot just be reached by through legal regulations because people have different social aspirations and different um, faiths and um, the law is not the only way to, uh, to settle these things. We should also be looking at um, political and social approaches. Tetapi di atas semua itu, kami menyatakan bahwa hukum bagaimanapun harus ditegakkan terhadap siapapun yang melakukan tindak kekerasan atau kriminal terhadap kelompok lain. But no matter what, um, we are convinced that the law must be upheld um, against those who conduct acts of violence against other groups. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Greg Feely from ANU. And uh, if I understood what you said correctly in your speech, uh, you felt that the restriction to six acknowledged religions, the Surah Idaram that you mentioned uh, from Khmenai, was discriminatory. And I would, uh, would like to have a further explanation of why it's discriminatory in the cases of religions that are not on that list, um, but you also seem to be saying that it was appropriate for the state to, if not ban, at least heavily restrict um, 
faith communities such as Ahmadiyya, or indeed we could expand that to the Jewish community, which is Ahl Kitab, it's the people of the book. You mentioned about there being proper methodology um, about deciding what is a pure religion and the like. So it's very hard to see on any grounds other than political grounds why Jews would not be on that list if we're talking theology and methodology, but also why is it um, acceptable to restrict religions such as Ahmadiyya or any number of other religions, Baha'is and the like, um, why is that not also discriminatory then? Baik. Uh, ada kesalahpahaman masyarakat terhad, ter, termasuk para uh, petitioner atau penggugat undang-undang nomor 1 tahun 65 seakan-akan Indonesia itu hanya mengakui enam agama padahal itu tidak betul there is a misperception, a social misperception of people applying uh, to the court uh, about the matter of the uh, Law number one, 1965, that there are only six recognized religions in Indonesia, and actually that is not true. Baik, saya terangkan tentang pasal itu. Pertama, undang-undang nomor satu itu mengatakan bahwa pemerintah melindungi dan membina semua agama seperti Islam, Kristen, Katolik, Bunda, Buddha, Hindu, dan Konghucu. Ada enam. Um, the article in law number one says that the government has uh, the obligation to protect and to provide guidance to all religions such as Christianity, Catholicism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, uh, Confucius, and, and Hindu. And Hinduism. Kemudian di dalam pasal berikutnya disebutkan bahwa negara dan pemerintah membiarkan agama lain sebagaimana adanya. And the next article states that um, other religions are allowed to exist as they are. Kata membiarkan itu, kata membiarkan itu, kemudian diartikan tidak melindungi. <laughs> and the, the word to allow has been interpreted to me not to protect. Padahal untuk bahasa Indonesia di tahun 1965, kata membiarkan itu artinya tidak menghalangi. Tidak mengganggu sehingga boleh hidup. Whereas in fact the meaning of tidak membiarkan or not to uh, sorry membiarkan to allow in 1965 was not to obstruct, not to disturb, um, not to forbid. Jadi sekarang agama-agama selain yang enam itu dibiarkan adanya artinya tidak dilarang untuk hidup di Indonesia. So the, the true meaning of the other religions being allowed to exist means that they are allowed to, they're not forbidden, but they have a right to exist in Indonesia. Saya ingin mengingatkan kita semua bahwa kita punya bahasa Indonesia yang agak modern itu baru mulai pada tahun 1973. And I'd like to, I'd like to remind you that the modern Indonesian we know really had its beginnings in 1973. Sedangkan pada tahun 1965 bahasa kita masih bercampur-campur dengan bahasa adat, bahasa asing dan sebagainya sehingga kata-kata yang kurang tepat itu masih dipakai di dalam undang-undang nomor 1 tahun 65. So that in 1965 we had a case of Indonesian being influenced by regional um, uh, languages or regional law, foreign languages, and therefore we have some sort of inaccurate um, words in the uh, this law number one of 1965. And that is being clearly um, stated in the, uh, the verdict, the judgment of the Constitutional Court that um, all um, religions are in fact allowed in Indonesia. Soal Ahmadiyah yang Bapak tanyakan tadi, dapat saya jelaskan memang problemnya orang Islam itu tidak akan menghalangi Ahmadiyah itu hidup di Indonesia, tetapi kalau menggunakan nama Islam, itu akidahnya harus sama. Um, so the problem with the Ahmadiyya in Indonesia is that the um, Muslims in Indonesia will not um, obstruct um, the existence of Ahmadiyya in Indonesia, provided it is faithful to the Muslim faith. 
doesn't use the name. Sorry. So it doesn't use the name. Provided doesn't use the the name in Islam. Yeah. Nah, oleh sebab itu dari pandangan orang-orang Islam Indonesia, Ahmadiyah itu silakan hidup dan tidak akan diganggu, tetapi jangan menggunakan sebagai nama agama Islam. Pakai saja nama agama lain. Gitu. So in other words, um, Ahmadiyah can remain um, if to existing in Indonesia will not be disturbed by the Muslims, but don't use the word, don't use the name religion of Islam. Use another religion. Ini bukan pandangan saya pribadi, tetapi pandangan majlis ulama Indonesia. Pandangan Nahdlatul Ulama di mana Pak Selamat Effendi Yusuf ada di dalamnya. Kita tidak akan mengganggu agama lain. Tetapi kalau menggunakan nama yang sudah paten, yang sudah diikuti pedoman-pedoman eh, utamanya, maka jangan dipakai nama lain karena itu dianggap sebagai penudaan terhadap agama. And this is not my, just my personal opinion, it's also uh, the uh, opinion of the uh, Majelis Ulama Indonesia and also Nagatmatul Ulama um, that as far as other religions are concerned, um, don't use the... If there's a religion that already has mainstream teachings and it's very clear what the religion is, don't take over that religion because we consider that to be a desecrational blasphemy. Yeah. Tetapi ini juga memang masih menjadi problem karena memakai nama itu juga adalah hak asasi manusia. <laughs> But we have a problem here because the right to use a name is also a human right. <laughs> <laughs> ini yang sedang kami olah di Indonesia untuk mencapai keseimbangan keseimbangan dalam kehidupan antar umat beragama. Ancaman. 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 Okay. Um, so um, this is what we're trying to process in Indonesia to uh, work out some sort of a balance um, for, between threats against religion. Okay. okay, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to take two more questions from the crowd again. So what I'm going to do is ask the two people, yes, you with your hand up, please, thank you, and the gentleman there with the grey shirt. I'm going to ask you both to give your questions, and then we'll hear answers from the Chief Justice. My name is Nahad, I'm a student here at the ANU. Um, my question is, um, I think, I found it contradictive, um, because earlier you said that state does not have the right to decide on the different interpretation of religion. And you said that um, these different interpretations should be discussed internally through MUI and other religious organizations. But then on the other hand, what we see is the increasing role of Bakar Bakam, the mm -hmm. Badan Koordinasi Pengawasan uh, Agama dan Aliran Kepercayaan. Um, and I found it, um, we found that the, the increasing role of Bakar Pakam um, is very disturbing because they pursue the persecution of religious dreams that they define, they define as Devia, yeah, for example, like the SKB Tiga Menteri, the uh, persecution of Alexander Aan was based on the recommendation of Bakar Pakam. So, if you say that it should be neutral and has the right, the right to interfere on this matter, how do you justify this very democratic practice of um, Bakar Pakam role? Because Bakar Pakam is chosen by state, it's not even through some democratic channels. What's my problem? Thank you. We'll just take the other question. So. Hello, I'm Wira from Crawford. My question is uh, based on uh, the Pancasila as well as the U number 165, don't you think that the state has been systematically discriminatory against polytheism in the sense that the first tenet of Pancasila says Ketuhanan Maesa, which means uh, one true God, whereas uh, for thousands of years traditionally people in Indonesia have believed in many gods and different kinds, uh, even animistic, but why are we so uh, historic and as you can see the monotheistic religions only came to Indonesia in the last 600 years? So uh, even in the first two of one of 65, it says religions which are similar to the uh, six mentioned, in which animism and polytheism, uh, in its diversity, does not, you know, is very different to it. Thank you. Baik, masalah bab korupakam. Jadi begini. Saudara melihat adanya kontradiksi dalam interpretasikan tentang kebebasan beragama itu eh, sehingga 
negara secara subihan mengatur melalui Undang-Undang Nomor 1 Tahun 2005. Um, so your question was about uh, the implementation or the actions of the coordinating board for monitoring and faith beliefs. Um, and you see a, a contraindication contra here as to um, the freedom of belief um, that has been um, stated as upheld by the state um, since the law number one, 1965. <laughs> undang-undang agar tidak terjadi saling menudai antar pemeluk agama. Um, so the, the purpose of this body that I mentioned earlier is to support the law so that the various religious groups and faiths do not um, uh, take part in actually blaspheming or desecrating their respective religions. Dan supaya diingat bahwa bakor bakom itu bukan hanya terdiri dari aparat pemerintah bukan hanya terdiri aparat penegak hukum tetapi juga di sana masuk tokoh-tokoh agama untuk membicarakan jalan keluar manakala terjadi konflik. And it should be remembered that the uh, members of these bodies are not just from government authorities and law enforcement agencies but also from religious leaders um, who are there to discuss the way out of conflict. Nah, oleh sebab itu paling tidak untuk sementara ini Bapak Pakem dan SKB Menteri SKB tiga Menteri itu merupakan pedoman sementara yang memang oleh pemerintah sedang dibicarakan untuk direvisi dan diperbaiki sehingga menjawab kebutuhan-kebutuhan terkini dalam penegakan hak asasi manusia. And for the time being, um, this is, uh, these are the, uh, the agencies that we are relying on. In addition to the, the joint degree of the three um, ministers, the uh, the Pakon Pakon. Um, is what we are relying on in, dis in discussions of the government as we're looking towards the revision and um, improvement of the laws um, with respect to these human rights matters. Tentunya, saudara maklum bahwa suatu negara itu harus mengantisipasi kemungkinan terjadinya saling main hakim sendiri di antara warga negara. And of course you will understand the state has to take into uh, needs to be uh, proactive against the uh, members of society who are taking the law into their own hands. Oleh sebab itu untuk saat ini adanya undang-undang nomor 1 tahun 65 yang kemudian melahirkan bakor pakum itu merupakan pedoman yang tersedia meskipun masih minimal untuk mengatasi persoalan-persoalan konflik antar pemeluk agama. Um, so this is um, why um, law number 1965, which has given birth to this um, badan bakor uh, bakor, which provides us with guidance for the time being, at least to when we have to face these conflicts between religious, uh, various different religious groups. Saya menyarankan anda nanti membaca putusan Mahkamah Konstitusi. <laughs> tentang undang nomor 1 tahun 65 di mana dinyatakan di situ bahwa undang-undang tersebut maupun bakor pakem supaya diperbaiki supaya direvisi and um, I, I urge you to read the, uh, the decree or the, the judgment of the constitutional court where it is, it is stated that um, we are very much recommend a revision of the uh, uh, of this uh, Kemudian yang kedua, ada pertanyaan Indonesia berdasarkan Pancasila menganut paham ketuhanan yang Maha yang diimplementasikan dalam bentuk agama agama. Um, and then there was a question about um, Indonesian state ideology or Pancasila and um, the first, uh, the first uh, one being of course a belief in a, in a uni unitary God um, and therefore with the reference to one of theistic um, religions. Pertanyaannya adalah, apakah animisme dan sebagainya yang ada sekarang di masyarakat-masyarakat Indonesia itu tidak diakui? keberadaannya karena itu juga bagian dari keyakinan. 
Um, and the question is, are um, animis animism and other faiths um, that exist in Indonesia, are they not um, considered to, are they not recognized by the state in Indonesia as faiths? Seperti saya katakan tadi, animisme itu dapat dikatakan sama dengan ateisme, artinya bukan agama. As I said before, animism can be considered as um, atheism, in other words, not a religion. Oleh sebab itu, di Indonesia sejauh itu dianut untuk kepentingan pribadi dan tidak dikampanyekan, tidak dipropagandakan, itu sama sekali tidak dilarang. And as I said before, if it's just for personal, your own personal adherence in this uh, faith and used for your own personal use, but there is no sort of social propagandizing of the religion, it's not forbidden. Di dalam kenyataannya sekarang di Indonesia itu animisme dapat dikatakan tidak ada lagi. Really, you can say nowadays in reality there is no animism remaining in Indonesia. Sebab penganut-penganut animisme melakukan ritual-ritual adat. Sekarang itu sebenarnya mereka juga sudah memeluk agama tertentu sehingga animisme itu menjadi peninggalan budaya dan adat yang tidak dianggap berimplikasi pada persoalan-persoalan agama. Um, so that um, the adherence of the previous adherence of these faiths in carrying out their ritual, their ritual, um, traditional rituals, in fact they carry out these ritual rituals as adherence of various existing religions. So these historical uh, remnants um, or cultural um, remnants are no longer have any implication towards the uh, religions of Indonesia. Di Probolinggo, Jawa Timur misalnya, setiap tahun masih ada upacara persembahan terhadap Gunung Merapi, mempersembahkan buah-buahan atau ternak yang dikorbankan untuk uh, kawah gunung di Probolinggo. For example, in Probolinggo and East Java, um, each year there are offerings made to Mount Mer uh, Merapi with in the form of fruit and also uh, uh, cattle um, that are surrendered to the um, crater of the volcano there. Tetapi mereka yang melakukan persembahan-persembahan atau ritual semacam itu, semuanya sudah beragama Islam. But those carrying out those offerings and rituals are all Muslims. Jadi animisme itu tinggal kebiasaan-kebiasaan yang bukan satu sistem keyakinan yang kuat di Indonesia. So animism is really just as a, a customary um, faith, but no longer part of a strong and um, religious uh, culture of Indonesia. Tetapi kalau ada problem uh, terhadap akta perkawinan dan akta pernikahan, maka solusinya sudah disiapkan sekarang ini oleh Menko Polhukam bersama Kementerian Dalam Negeri. Um, but with regard to the marriage certificate, as I mentioned earlier, um, a solution is being prepared by the coordinating minister for economic and political affairs and the minister for home affairs. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your generosity.